You're listening to a podcast by Way Collective, a contemplative community for love and liberation in Santa Barbara, California. This recording was our conversation starter at our dinner and dialogue gathering on September 18th, 2024. Thanks for tuning in. Well, uh, last week we began this new series of conversations by looking at the situation before us. Namely, that in the midst of a divisive and fragmenting culture, we're called to ground in compassion so that we can move toward one another with a healing presence. And tonight I want to continue on, not only in that compassionate grounding, but also talk a little bit more about the societal ills that we're facing and how we might name the foundations of our division so that we can pull them out by the root. So without getting too deep into the moral psychology and physiology around our human tendency toward in-groups and out-groups, I wanna begin by saying it as simply and as clearly as I can tonight. We live in a time where we're facing A, a societal norm of punitiveness, B, the feeling of political disgust toward the opposite side of the aisle, and C, the challenge to be a people who choose hope rather than fear in the midst of this. So tonight I wanna unpack these ideas in a way that makes them tangible for us so that each of us can see as clearly as possible the roots of our fear and also the ways that we can transcend that fear in the name of love. So firstly, we live in a time when judgmentalism and punitiveness are an instantaneous response to being challenged. Uh, The author Adrienne Marie Brown writes that our response to conflict, harm, or abuse is consistently punitive and too often joyful. We're afraid and we think it will assuage our fears and make us safer if we can clarify an enemy a someone outside of ourselves who is to blame, who's guilty, who is the origin of harm. And instant judgment and punishment are practices of power over others. So as people who are committed to compassionate connection with each other, I'm bringing this up because we need to recognize the water that we're swimming in. Notice that Brown named fear as a culprit here. And they named that the result of fear in our culture is a punitive tendency. And that when there's conflict, our culture has learned to instantaneously default to this option. So no wonder when we look at our political climate and we look at those in our lives with whom we differ, we have a hard time finding inroads to staying connected. We've learned to be fearful of conflict rather than see differences as contrasts to be harmonized. You know, I I sometimes think musically about this. You know how if you play two notes next to each other on the piano that are a half step away from one another, you get this sound that feels wrought with tension and dissonance. But musically, depending on the composition, everything can become a harmony. And rather than sit in the disparaging tensions forever, there's always an opportunity to resolve the melody and to create music. And to me, it often feels like we've collapsed our differences into the idea that difference means conflict and that a perceived conflict is a threat that generates fear. And it's that fear that becomes a barrier to trust and intimacy and connection. So if this fearful trend continues, it's always going to create the same result, which is othering. Because the sentiment behind it is, we are good, they are bad, we are right, they are wrong, you know? So hopefully we can see clearly here that the root of othering is fear, which keeps us from the possibilities of friendship and connection. Now, the phenomenon that's happening is that in this fear, we also fear acting in ways that could get us called out, quote unquote. I mean, I've spoken to many of you who, even in a space like we try to create here at Way Collective, a space for circles of trust, you still don't feel safe or free to share your opinions on certain topics for fear of what others might think about you. The fear of accidentally doing harm, for the fear of being called out, or ultimately for fear of losing relationships or friendships. 
And Brown states that the knee-jerk call-outs in our culture say that those who cause harm or mess up or disagree with us cannot change and cannot belong. They must be eradicated. The bad things in the world cannot change and we must disappear the bad until there's only good left. Friends, this isn't working. I'm a believer that this fear is actually about losing intimacy, about losing belonging. It's actually a fear of being eradicated. Again, like I mentioned briefly last week, when ideology alone becomes the binding agent for a relationship, then we can only be significantly connected with people who share our ideology, precisely because it's the only place that we end up feeling safe in our culture. And each of us know, and many of us sadly by experience, that when we step outside the ideological center of gravity of a relationship or a community that we're a part of, we risk being naturally diffused from that community. For instance, many of you know that I used to work in a large church, and that church, while being part of a more open and affirming denomination, at a certain point in its life was migrating away from that denomination over LGBTQIA plus belonging. And when I stood my ground in saying that I didn't think that position of denying belonging was tenable, I was told by one of the leaders in that community that God was calling me elsewhere. And I had a stop date put to my employment there. Now, I know that not everyone has had this exact same experience, but I do know that many of us are carrying deep concerns and questions about how we can stay connected to those loved ones with whom we disagree. You know, is that even possible? So on the one hand, that situation hurt me, right? I thought I belonged to a church that was a part of a denomination that had room for a diversity of perspective. And when I found out I was wrong about that, that exit from the community was not easy on me. But here's the other side of it. On the other hand, I now understand that human beings create communities around shared values and often around shared morality. And for better or worse, that is just something that we do. So looking back, I've come to peace in understanding that not only is holding the moral boundaries of an in-group a thoroughly human thing to do, but because their center of gravity so differed from mine, it was probably the right or the natural thing for me to go. So here's what I wanna say about this. It's important to know that any community even way collective, has a moral center of gravity, and I would even say, yes, an ideological commitment, even if it's to something like love and liberation or the like. There's no in-group that doesn't have something like that. But what we have to recognize is how to hold that commitment together without becoming an agent of disconnection. That's the challenge and the magic to it. So how do we combat the punitive, fear-based tendencies of our society? We have to let go of the belief that if I differ from you, then we don't belong together. Brown says that the deepest layer of this fear is the fear that we cannot change. It's the fear that we do not believe we can create some compelling pathways from being harm doers to being healed and growing. It's the fear that we do not believe we can hold the complexity of a gray situation. She says we do not believe even in our own complexity. We do not believe we can navigate conflict and struggle together in principled ways. And and it's the fear that we can only handle binary thinking, right? Good or bad, innocent or guilty, angel or abuser, black or white, etc. Now, the emotion that accompanies this fear is what a philosopher and theologian friend of mine named Jay McDaniels calls high levels of political disgust. And he writes that while this disgust has an evolutionary biological history to it, it can also work against us as bad actors use it to try to manipulate and intensify our fear, anger, and polarization. Because disgust is primarily an emotion that shapes and colors our judgments and perceptions, Jay argues that what we have to learn to shift is a shift from a politics of mutual disgust to one of mutual familiarity, dialogue, 
and where possible, even friendship. So we need a new narrative or a new way of looking at the world that emphasizes cooperation over competition, that emphasizes inclusion over disgust, and even partnership over partisanship. Okay, so if I'm being honest with you all, on the surface, these ideas sound really nice, right? Like partnership over partisanship, it's snappy, right? Yeah, I, I would agree with that, that sounds great, I'm all in on that. But then the rubber meets the road of what that actually looks like to live it out. And I've got to figure out how to cultivate this in myself. And here is where the hope comes in. We can't force others to cultivate this in themselves, even those we really want to stay connected with. But we can be responsible to change ourselves. And let me tell you why this is good news. Like we spoke about last week, Changing the world begins with inner transformation. And let me offer that a contemplative Christian spirituality is actually a pretty great framework for this new way of looking at the world that Jay invites of us. I love that John's Jesus is quoted as having said, My peace I leave you, my peace I give to you, but I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. Now, please don't hear a new dualism between the world and God's chosen people here. That's not where we're going. Rather, simply think of the world in this scripture in the way we've spoken about it tonight. As our society's norms of fear, disgust, division, and punitiveness. And the contrast to that is the invitation and responsibility to live unafraid ourselves to live into what Christ speaks of barely a chapter later, which is to live in love. That's the new command. To learn to not let our hearts be troubled by another's opinion or ideology that differs from ours, but instead to become the kinds of people who promote life and flourishing no matter what is thrown back our way. And so to be a people of hope who do not give in to the cynicism and disdain of our time We have to put on the eyes of God to see the sacredness of every human being, especially those with whom we radically differ. Because where love takes root, fear is uprooted. Where dialogue takes root, disgust and division are uprooted. And where partnership takes root, punitiveness can be uprooted as well. The challenge is to set the taproot of our heart down in love in such a way that this courage and hope become our ground. And I recognize this isn't easy, but it might feel a little more achievable if we can realize that we can't control others' responses to kindness and inclusion. And while they may not return that kindness and inclusion back to us, That's where each of us have the freedom to create healthy boundaries if needed. But what we can control is our own commitment to and our rootedness in the way of love. So let's chat about this. Thanks for listening to this podcast by Way Collective. To keep up with our community, you can subscribe to this podcast. Go to www.waycollective.org or follow us on Instagram at, at Way Collective. Peace and every good, y'all.